said, it was uh, 35 hours door to door. So, uh, yeah, but it's definitely worth it. It's been, uh, been wonderful being here. Um, I'm going to be talking to you, of course, about integration service environment. And uh, this slide has a lot of really, really boring information on it that you can easily find if you just uh, go, to, go to LinkedIn. So instead, I'll tell you about the one more, much more interesting fact about me than uh, that isn't on this slide is that I definitely, hands down, take the prize for the furthest travel to come to this conference today. So there we go, <laughs> 35 hours. Um, and you know Australia gets a bit of a bad rap, and uh, sometimes, and this is uh, this is probably why. Uh, after all, we have eight of the ten most venomous snakes in the world. This one here is is the um, uh, the eastern brown snake, which uh, which I, although I didn't take this picture, it actually lives around my neighborhood. So. Um, and, you know, we also have the funnel back spider, which, um, you know, if uh, you, know, you can see the fangs on that thing, if that bites you, you have about 15 minutes to live without <laughs> an antidote. Um, we have the red back spider, which is very, very closely related to the black widow spider. I don't know if you have black widows here in this part of the world. We have them in the United States. And uh, I kid you not, even the toads are poisonous. This is, a, this is a cane toad. It secretes poison on its back, and although it's not deadly to humans, it is to pets uh, like dogs and cats. And you're not safe in the water either because we've got the blue-ringed octopus, which has, you know, can give you one little nip, and it's very deadly poison. We've got the box jellyfish, which gives you really, really nasty stings. And, of course, everybody knows about the sharks. But um, while you're all crossing Australia off your list now of places that you want to visit in the world or wondering how we ever survive, I'm just going to give you a, very, a couple of very interesting statistics. Uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics compiled some data over the course of 2008 to 2017, which is 10 years. And in all those 10 years, less than 300 people have actually died from animal-related deaths. Actually, it was 266. Um, even and when you on every death, every life is significant, of course. But you know, when you compare that to the number of those killed in road accidents or drug users, uh, drug drug abuse, or um, in the United States, every hour, the number of those died by shootings, uh, it doesn't seem that that significant when Australia has 25 million people. Uh, the other interesting statistic is that the animal that is most that has caused the most death is none of these, but in fact that. Uh, apparently, horses and cows and other travel uh, animals are, are responsible for 77 of those deaths of the 266. So, and here I thought that mad cow is only you know a problem in uh, the UK. Anyway, on with the uh, subject. Before I uh, start talking about what integration service environment is, uh, I just want to give a little brief review about what IPaaS is. So. PaaS, of course, is platform as a service. It means that in, in the Azure landscape, you don't have to worry about provisioning machines, right? You don't want to have to look after uh, VMs. So um, if you just want to host a website or host a SQL database or whatever, you want a place to do that. And uh, Azure or Microsoft takes care of the managing the infrastructure that supports that. So IPaaS is integration platform as a service. So it's, con it's concerned with the specific Azure services that support enterprise integration. So there are four services that have been branded in this package called Azure Integration Services. I'll go over them very, very quickly. Uh, the first one is Service Bus. So Service Bus gives you that robust asynchronous messaging platform. And I, of all of the uh, Azure integration solutions that myself or my colleagues have built, I can't think of a single one of them that doesn't use Service Bus because messaging is so integral to doing integration solutions. And of course, we, you know, we live in the world of APIs now where you have to expose lots of APIs for everything, but that also means that you have to provide governance, security, discoverability, developer support, analytics, all that kind of stuff uh, to manage those properly in an enterprise situation. And API management in the Microsoft world is, is exactly the tool that you need to do that. Uh, Event-based integration is also becoming very, uh, very popular and used, and that's because we live in a world where we want real-time notifications of things. So we want to be able to react to events as they happen, and that can trigger processes or, or notifications. So EventGrid is, is really, really good for that because it uh, not only connects seamlessly with a whole bunch of Azure services, but you can also uh, interact with it with external services as well. 
And uh, lastly is Logic Apps, which is kind of the glue for uh, pulling this stuff together because Logic Apps enables you to orchestrate all of your integration, all of your API calls and through workflow. And on top of that, it comes out of the box with over 300 connectors that you can use to connect to just about any kind of SaaS service that you can imagine, you know, be it Salesforce or Box or, um, or Dynamic CRM. Uh, as well as connecting to enterprise applications that live in your corporate network. So there's enterprise connectors for that as well. Uh, there's a, other than those four services, there's a few other things that we often use in integration solutions too. For example, functions for being able to run arbitrary code, or event hubs, which is a little bit different than event grid in that um, while event grid is designed to be reactive and, and to broadcast events as they happen, event hubs has got the ability to, um, to ingest those and then actually uh, stream them and replay them like a tape recorder. So you can use that for collecting events when you're doing analytics and that kind of stuff. Now, very often our integration solutions have to work in the context or with uh, network-related resources. So thankfully, uh, these services support uh, VNet integration. So if you need that with Service Bus, you can get that through the premium tier. If you want it for API management, again, the premium tier offers VNet integration. I'm going to jump around a little bit here. Functions, if you want that, you need a premium plan. And for event hubs, you need at least a standard uh, uh, tier or a dedicated. Are you kind of noticing a pattern here? Um, virtual network integration doesn't come cheap, right? You're never going to find this in a basic plan for anything. Now, Event Grid doesn't really have tiers. Uh, the way that works with, um, uh, with network stuff is that it uses service endpoints. So, uh, for example, with a storage queue, you can link that endpoint in uh, using a service endpoint to Event Grid, and that way you can have that confined by the rules of a, of a virtual network. The one that was missing integration was Logic Apps. There was no out-of-the-box way uh, to make that work in the context of a virtual network. You had to uh, do workarounds with that. You could put API management in front of it, for example, uh, so that you didn't have to expose the endpoint to the internet. Uh, but ISE actually solved that problem. So most of you are probably familiar with app service environment. Is that right? A lot of people understand what that is. So, so app services, of course, are where you host your web apps and your API apps, your mobile, app, mobile apps. The app service environment was created to uh, give you that level of isolation and control that some enterprises felt that they needed. So they wanted to have their own dedicated space for running their stuff, and they wanted to be able to control their network in ways that you can't do with the normal PaaS solution in app service. Uh, so that enabled you to do things, for example, uh, like connect with your on-prem. Uh, resources using uh, an express router or a site-to-site -site connection. So integration service environment really is just app service environment for Logic Apps and integration accounts. Uh, because prior to this, there was no way to be able to run an, an, a Logic App in a dedicated environment. It was, it's a serverless only offering with a consumption-based model. So what does that actually offer you? Well, I've already talked about VNet connectivity. Uh, that's a big feature. With that, you also get private static outbound IB, IPs, and the key word here is private. You do get static outbound IPs with normal logic apps, but they're not necessarily exclusive to your application. And I'll talk more about that in detail later. I'll actually have a demo about that. Uh, because you're working with your own virtual network, that means that you can put a DNS server in there, and that gives you the ability to have custom inbound domain names uh, for your logic apps instead of using the, the normal Azure one out of the box. Uh, it is an isolated environment, so you get your dedicated compute and isolated storage, and that helps shield you from the possibility of noisy neighbor. Uh, so if there's, other, um, if there's other people using those same resources in your region, you know, that could potentially exhaust or, uh, or impact on the performance of yours. You're, you're isolated from that. And the other uh, potential benefit is, cl is flat cost, which is attractive to some organizations that want to have predictability about what their charges are going to be. Serverless and consumption-based model is great and generally can save you lots of money, but it's also unpredictable, right? Because it depends on, on how much you're using it. When you provision 
ISE, basically you start with a base unit, and that base unit gives you the capacity for approximately 160 million actions per month. And that's not a hard limit, it's just this is what Microsoft says, we know we can support this uh, with your basic unit. If you need to do more than that, then you have the ability to scale up by adding additional scale units, and each of those will add another 80 million uh, uh, executions as well. With the base unit, you also get bundled in a standard integration account, which is actually of good value because that costs, one of those costs approximately 1,000 US a month. And you use an integration account when you, want to, um, when you need schemas or maps or agreements for B2B processing. Uh, an integration account is how you store those things so that you can use them in your logic apps. Um, you also get unlimited connections with one enterprise connectors. So the enterprise connectors cost a little bit more than the, uh, the regular connectors because, uh, because of what they can do. They can basically reach down into your corporate network. Um, so they're not in a consumption-based model, they're charged at a higher rate. Here you get that uh, with unlimited connections, uh, or at least one of those, uh, with your base unit. And of course, we've already talked about the VNet connectivity, and it has full redundancy during recycle in the premium SKU. Now recently, uh, because, it, because this is, is kind of expensive, they introduced a developer SKU that you could use when you're starting to work with it. And the developer SKU is pretty much the same with the exception that you can't scale it, uh, you only get the base unit. Uh, there is no SLA with it, so for example, if you restart the ISE, you might have some downtime where you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have that with the premium SKU. And they've just um, they've lowered the integration uh, account down to a free integration account, which doesn't have quite as much features as the standard one does. The capacity, that's the only difference. So you shouldn't use this in production, but you, should, you can use it in your test and your development. So to talk about the architecture, first we'll talk about what the normal Logic App architecture is. Uh, how many people here have used Logic, yep, Logic Apps? Oh good, a lot of you. Okay, so you're familiar with it then. And basically you have a visual designer for constructing a workflow. Uh, that gets translated into workflow definition language, which is just JSON. And uh, what happens is that the engine takes that and, and uh, turns it into a whole bunch of tasks that run, and those tasks can run uh, concurrently, so it's very, uh, very efficient. How that's actually executed is that in any given region in Azure, you've got four components that are, that are making this impossible. Uh, the first is your Logic Apps resource provider, and what that does is that translates your workflow definition language into those tasks, that actually, those executable tasks that run. And then you have a runtime that those tasks actually function within. Uh, you also have a connection manager, uh, which takes care of all of the details, like the configuration, the security, the certificates, and all uh, for the connectors that you actually provision, and then a runtime for those connectors. Now, in the consumption-based uh, model, all of that's shared in that region, so every logic app that's running is, is using these components in that region. When you provision an ISE, you basically, within your subscription, you set up your own VNet, and that VNet has to contain uh, a minimum of four subnets, and you ha they have to be empty subnets when you're, uh, when you're provisioning the ISE, and you have to have at least 32 available addresses in each one of those subnets. And your ISE is basically injected into that virtual network. And what that means is that the runtime components for both the logic apps and the connectors are now moved into that virtual network, and they run there in isolation. The management components stay out in the region, but that doesn't really affect your, the isolation that you actually need uh, or the performance. So, uh, but just so you know that that stays out in, in the region. Now, when you actually deploy your logic apps into your ISE, uh, you're, uh, in order to ensure that they're actually running in that ISE, you have to limit yourself to the, to the connectors and the actions that actually have a label of either core or ISE on them. When you use those, uh, then you know that they're running in the context of your own virtual network. Right now, that's, that's not all of them. That's probably a dozen or so of the 300 connectors are there. They're adding more all the time. You still have the capacity to use the other connectors, so you, you, all 300 are available to you, but only the ones with those badges will actually uh, run in the context of your virtual network. So once you have that, what does that actually give you? 
Uh, well, it means that now you can connect directly to other Azure resources that, that have to work in the context of a virtual network. For example, virtual machines uh, or an app service environment uh, or API management if you're running it in a, in a virtual network. Uh, before, you, know, you would have had to expose endpoints for those uh, to the internet to be able to reach them, but now you can get them through, the, uh, through network peering. And for other services that may not run directly in virtual networks, but expose service endpoints, you can also use those too. So for example, service bus or maybe table storage uh, that can expose service endpoints that you can use. And of course, uh, if you want to set up a site-to-site -site connection or express route, you can then access networks that, are, uh, that represent your on-prem uh, corporate resources. So it gives you that network level connectivity that we didn't have before. So in order to create an ISC, the first step is that you have to have a virtual network. Um, so chances are in production you'll already have one anyway. Uh, but remember that you're going to need to have those four empty subnets with those 32 addresses in each of them. And the uh, network has to exist in the same subscription and the same region as where you want to set up your ISC. Uh, the next step is you just simply go in the portal and, and create, you search for integration service environment, and uh, you get this nice little form here. Most of it looks very familiar. It always asks you things like your subscription and your region and your resource group. Um, so a few key things in there is uh, there's a SKU where you choose whether you want developer or premium. Uh, you can uh, choose to scale it right from the beginning. Zero, it means that you just get the base. Um, scale unit, but if you want to add some from the very beginning, you can do that. You can always scale up later, though, if you want to. And you specify your virtual network, and you also, um, more recently, they added an access endpoint uh, property, which means can be either internal or external. So if you're familiar with ASC about using an ILB, uh, inter internal load balancer ASC, where you want to have your endpoints only exposed within the network, you can do the same thing here uh, with an ISC. Or you can choose external and your logic app endpoints can be accessible from outside. So once you fill all that out and hit create, um, then you go and have a little bit of a coffee break or lunch break, because it takes about an hour to an hour and a half for it to provision uh, the environment. That sounds like a long time, but when it was in preview, it was three hours, so it's definitely improved. Um, the other possibility uh, is, and, and probably you do this after you've created the first one manually, is that you can create the ISC through an ARM template as well. It is supported uh, to do that. So, and, and if you're going to start that way, uh, the simplest way that I would recommend is to go to that link. And by the way, I will publish these slides uh, afterwards, so just keep an eye on Twitter with the PolarConf tag, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put up the URL where these are. Um, you can uh, basically access this template that was created by Thiago Almeida, and when you go deploy to Azure, it will take you to this form, and you can see that you supply all the details about your, your subnets in there, and it will pr create an ARM template for you and, and deploy it to Azure. So Now that you have your ISC, you want to actually deploy your logic apps into it. And there's three ways that you can do this. Um, you can create logic apps the normal way, which is directly from the portal. Um, the thing you have to be careful of is when you specify the location, uh, you don't just cho choose the region like you normally do. You actually choose the integration service environment as the location. And if you're in the right subscription and region, that should appear in there. Um, it's easy to get that wrong, because if you, if you actually just put it in the region, it's not going to be running within your ISC. A safer way maybe to do it is to go into the ISC itself, uh, because, and I'll show you what that looks like in the portal in a minute. Um, there's a Logic Apps tab in there. If you go in there and you click Add there, it's automatically putting it in your ISC for you. And the third option is, is ARM templates. So you can still use your ARM templates to uh, deploy Logic Apps. Um, the only thing you have to do is you have to add an additional property, which is what's highlighted there on the screen. Uh, hopefully you can, you can see that, but it's basically just, just a, a one-liner that indicates that it, this is going to run within uh, an integration service environment, and you give it the details of that, of that ISC. So um, that works pretty well. It works as well as ARM templates do work for Logic Apps. I know there are some challenges uh, with, uh, with ARM templates and DevOps of getting Logic Apps deployed, but um, this doesn't improve that, but it does give you the ability to deploy into an ISC. 
So the, uh, the re rest of the presentation I'm going to talk about is actually when you use this, because it is kind of an expensive option. So um, one of the first scenarios uh, that I can think of is when you need to have those private outbound IP addresses. So we've had this happen with a client where we needed to send FTP files to them, and, um, and they demanded that they had the IP address that it was coming from in order to whitelist it. So with logic apps, um, even normal logic apps, you get a list, a finite list of outbound IP addresses that will work. The problem is that those IP addresses are used by anyone who is running those connectors in that region in Azure. So you can't say that they're exclusively coming from you. You can't promise that, that, that that's the case. And typically, if they're doing IP whitelisting, it's because they want to know that it's definitely coming from you. So because with an ISE, you, are, you have your dedicated VNet, then you have your own dedicated set of outbound IP addresses, and you can tell them, you know, put your hand on your heart and say, if it comes from this IP address, it's definitely coming from my application. So I'm just going to do a little demo now to kind of show you how that, um, how that works. And of course, you can't see that, can you? All right. Turn off, sorry. Oh, ah, is it? Yes, it is, isn't it? Sorry, I haven't changed the time on my, um, OK. Uh, yes, let me do that. OK, first of all, I have to escape that. Uh, nightlight. Oh, yeah, I can do it that way, can I? Thank you. There we go. That probably looks better. All right. OK. So uh, what we have here is a virtual machine that I have running in, in Azure. And you can see that I've deployed an FTP server on it. Um, and that FTP server has an in folder, which right now is empty. There's, there's nothing in there. So I'm going to show you next um, uh, my ISE. Okay, which is here. So this is when you provision the ISC. You this is the um, this is the con the control page for it in the portal. Like everything else, it has you know an overview page and a bunch of other pages as well. Um, you can see that uh, with the ISC, you get some information about the processor usage and the memory usage. It's just taking a little bit of time to uh, load the information for some reason. Uh, but in here, I've also got. Uh, uh, to logic apps that are deployed. And hopefully that's going to refresh pretty quickly. Um, for, I have it open in another tab anyway. One of those logic apps is uh, send FTP file. So it's very, very simple. Uh, I get an HTTP request that comes in, and then I'm using the create file operation on the FTP connector. Uh, to basically turn that um, into a file that gets saved and sent to my um, get sent to my FTP server that's running on that virtual machine. Now, what I want to show you is if you can see this see this core badge. So that means that this trigger is actually running in the context of my ISE because it has that core badge. Now, interestingly, this uh, this um, FTP connector doesn't show the badge, which is uh, what I told you it needs to. That's a little bit of a designer bug, I think, because I'll prove to you if I add an action and I choose FTP and wait for that to load, you'll see that I actually get two FTP connectors. One has an ISC badge and the other doesn't. So this, the one that doesn't, if I chose that, it would be running outside the ISC. But I actually chose this one. And then I chose the uh, particular operation where I wanted, which is create file, which again has an ISC badge on it. But notice it doesn't actually show uh, the label. Uh, so I just think that's a bug. In the, it, but it actually is definitely uh, using the one from ISC. So I'll just delete that right now, because we don't want that. OK. Okay. Um, so very, very simple logic app. Uh, and all we really need to do is to, uh, is to call it. So 
I will now use Postman for that. And first, I have to copy the copy the request address. And I'll paste that in here. OK, so um, with, uh, with endpoints, by the way, for, um, for logic apps, you know, they work on shared access signatures. So you can see that there's, uh, there's some credentials that, and, a, and a key and a signature that's involved in that. But as for the body, I'm just sending a little bit of XML. I'll go ahead and send it. Now, my logic app isn't actually returning any particular uh, data. So we won't see anything come back in response. But we do see the 202 accepted up here. And if I go back to my, um, my FTP, we'll see we have the file uh, that's arrived in the end folder. And it actually contains the, uh, the same information that, that I sent in the request. Nobody should be impressed with that. That's a very simple logic app feature, which has been you know, around for years. The reason I wanted to, uh, to show you this is because I want you to see that in the log files, uh, if we look at the IP address, so the, um, so the client IP address is, is like the, one, uh, the second field that comes in here. And if we look at the latest one that was sent, which was uh, 142 PM, which is the, the local time, we've got this IP address here. I'm just going to copy that. Okay, and I'm going to, uh, before I lose that in my clipboard, I'm just going to put it in here. Okay, uh, is that big enough for you to see? Can you read that? Yeah, good. Okay, so I'm going to show you where you find out what the I outgoing IP addresses are. If you go to your ISE, okay, there's my two logic apps listed, and I go to the properties tab, uh, there is a list here of connector outbound IP addresses. You can see that list there. OK? I'm just going to copy that list okay, and go back to Visual Studio. And I'm going to uh, just format that a little nicer so it's easy to see. OK, and what you'll see is that the, at the IP address that was on my FTP server as a source is exactly one of those. So we've proven that the request actually came from a connector that's running within my, my IS, ISC. That's basically all I wanted to show you. So we can, we can count on that capability. All right, go back to the PowerPoint. Excellent. OK, so uh, that's the first scenario uh, that I covered. The second scenario that, uh, that might warrant the use of an ISC is uh, when you demand predictable performance, and more importantly, control over that performance, perf uh, control over the scaling. Uh, one of the great things about serverless offerings is that you don't generally think about scaling. You never really have to worry about it, because serverless, it will scale for you, right? The, the higher the demand, the more the service will scale. And of course, the more you're going to pay on your bill, uh, because it's consumption-based. And normally, that works fine. But let's say that you have an event planned, something like, uh, let's say, Black Friday or some other uh, click frenzy type of event where you know that at 8 o'clock on Friday morning, you're going to get 10 million requests in the first minute. And um, while serverless would work, it would, it would scale up, there will be a slight period of time where it needs to like, expand and, and warm up. And some of your users are likely to experience a bit of difficulty, some delays or whatever. And you decide that you don't want that. You want to scale in advance and have everything up and running so that it can handle those 10 million requests right from the get-go. There is no way to do that with normal logic apps. The consumption model doesn't give you a scaling feature. But the ISE does. Because this is a dedicated resource, you can actually explicitly control how scaling works. And I'm going to give you, uh, I've got screenshots here, but I'm actually just going to give you a, a demonstration live of what that looks like. So just escape that. And we'll go back to my logic apps. So um, in, the, uh, in the ISE, uh, we have scale out as a page. And I should uh, point out that this is only available in the premium SKU, right? If you choose the dev SKU, there is no scaling uh, capability in it. Uh, so if I want to, I can manually scale just using this slider bar and you know, have a static level. It goes all the way up to 10. So I can add 10 scale units you know, with 80 million transactions each um, uh, on top of this, uh, the base scale unit if I want to. 
But I can also choose custom auto scale. And yes. Uh, not sure why this is so slow. Um, it's possible because I've provisioned this in Australia. OK. Um, so when you choose auto scale, then basically this, this works on a series of rules. So there's always a default rule. Uh, the default rule, which you can't delete, is just the one that, that executes when no other rule satisfies the condition uh, for that scaling. And uh, this would be what you'd set it to whatever you want it to run normally, right? Say I just always want it to run you know, a minimum of, of one or a maximum of two, and that's and the default of one. So that's, that's how this is configured uh, out of the box. If I want to add another rule, I just say add scale condition. And I hope you can see this. Uh, OK, you can read that. Um, this looks the same if I choose scale based. Um, actually, I would probably, for Black Friday, choose scale to a specific instance count. And for this, I can give it a, an explicit instance count, but I can also give it a schedule. So I can say, for example, on this date, between these hours, I want you to just run 10 instances or eight instances or, wh or whatever you want. And that would be perfect for your Black Friday uh, scenario. You can also choose the scale based on a metric. So to do that, I just need to add a rule. And in the rule, uh, and this is, I think, a common dialogue in, in Azure for anything that allows you to set auto scaling, like probably apps, app services. Um, so once it loads, uh, there are a lot of different metrics that you can base your scaling on. And as soon as that comes in, I'll show them to you. Not sure why that's so slow. It wasn't um, wasn't slow when I was doing this in Sweden the other night. So I'm not sure if there's something happening with the uh, um, with the internet between here and uh, Australia. There we go. Okay. So uh, you can see that you you can basically your aggregation can be either by average or minimum or maximum or count, um, and the actual metrics that you can use uh, there is you know there are definitely metrics. And say no metrics. I think that's also taking a while to load for some reason. Um, oh, yeah, that's oh okay. That normally that's uh, that's picked picks automatically. No, that's very very interesting. That's. Uh, that's not working. Right, OK. Well, normally, there is a, a very lengthy list in there of about 30 different metrics that you can choose. And it has everything to do from the, the number of triggers or trigger failures or the number of action executions, uh, whether or not uh, how, how many have happened over a period of time. Um, and then you can set, um, set you know, uh, the the duration of the of the time that it needs to run for it's a, it's a very very um, sophisticated um, capability for executing uh, a metric based scale out for you and then of course so the cool down period as well you can set that so how long it needs to uh, needs to drop down before it starts to reduce the number of instances or scale units that are deployed so um, yeah really not sure why that's not loading today um, but I think I've got. Uh, a screenshot of it somewhere. So let me just uh, go back to my slides. I actually show. All right. So if you look here, uh, you can see that at least you can see one of the metrics, which is action latency. Okay. But there is a list of about 30 of them in there that you can choose from. Okay, I'm sorry that that didn't uh, didn't load. I'm not sure why. All right, uh, moving on to the third scenario. So um, Logic App supports hybrid connectivity, right? And the way it does that is through your enterprise connectors in something called the on-premise data gateway uh, that many of you might have used uh, before. So it's based on relay technology, and you are able to send messages down into systems in your cor corporate network. 
The problem with it is that the on-prem data gateway only out of the box supports about a dozen different uh, connection types, right? Now, it covers a lot of the big ones. It covers SQL Server, SAP, Oracle, IBM stuff, BizTalk Server, uh, and then a bunch of others I, I can't remember offhand. Um, so that, that's great if you've got those systems, but if you want to connect to something that isn't in that list, then you have to create a custom connector. It's not that hard to create a custom connector, but maybe you don't really want to you know, have your developer resources uh, occupied with that. And the other thing, too, is that there are some constraints with using the on-prem data gateway. For example, there's a limit on the message size. I think it's two megabyte. Somebody the other day told me they thought it was three. But in any case, there is a, there is a, length, a, a limit on it. And if you're going to send really large messages, then um, you're going to have to do some chunking. Uh, with um, ISE, you don't have that problem because you're basically, your connectors are working inside of a virtual network, right? So you just have direct access. So things like uh, SFTP or SMTP, which is not supported by the on-prem not a gateway, you can use that uh, with an ISE. And uh, as well as anything that, that can work with HTTP, right? With the HTTP REST. So um, that's, um, that's a benefit of using the ISE. So for my demo here, I'm just going to show you an example of being able to connect to a, a web API that's deployed using, um, using uh, uh, network connectivity. So what I've got here, you can see it. Uh, yep, let's expand that. So this is a, a virtual machine. I hope you can see that IP address, 150.101.1561. This is a virtual machine that's actually running um, in a, an on-prem uh, server that's in my friend Bill Chestnut's house uh, back in Victoria. <laughs> okay, Bill is um, Bill's a, a, an MVP. He's been an MVP for like 17 years. And um, you probably know his, by his handle, BizTalk Bill. And he's the only person I know who actually has a server rack in the middle of his house. Uh, when he turns his computer on, you know, the lights dim on the street. Um, so he's very kindly running a virtual machine in, um, in his data center, and he set up a VPN that's connected to my virtual network that I have my ISE running into. So um, I am basically showed you that IP address because that's, uh, that's the IP, the public IP address for his machine. I've got a very simple web API deployed on that server, and when I say simple, I mean very simple. Um, all it really is is a standard Hello World um, method where you, you send in a name and it spits it back hello, and it also spits back the IP address of where that request came from uh, for convenience. So in my ISE, I have deployed a logic app uh, that actually does that. Yes, that's right. I don't want to save that. Thank you. Um, and that logic app, uh, wait for that list. I don't have to wait for that list to refresh. It's there. Um, it's this one. And it's very simple. So this has, uh, again, takes a, an HTTP request. It then uh, formats a response, uh, which it then sends to that, that server. And if you notice the IP address that that's using, that is a local IP address. It's not an external one. It starts at 172. Uh, that's actually the, the local IP address for that virtual machine. And, uh, and then it uh, basically comes back with, uh, with the response this, uh, the, that, that, that that API uh, gives. And you'll notice that all three of these uh, shapes are using the core badge, because they're all, so they're definitely running within my ISE. So if I go and call this method, again, I have to copy the URL uh, from the trigger shape, and I've got a postman request set up for that. We'll paste that in there. Uh, I need to add one extra parameter, and that parameter is the name parameter. Um, so I'll just do polar conf. How's that? Okay, so if I go and send that request, uh, I should get back a response that tells me what... There it is. Okay, can you all read that? It says, hello, uh, polar conf, your IP address is 10114. Uh, I'm going to copy that IP address. Go back into here. Okay, uh, and we want to check and see: Does that actually really coming from my ISE? 
Well, first of all, the, the thing to note is that it's a local IP address, right? It starts with 10. So this is not, this is uh, something that's, that's um, been sent from within that network where this resides. And if I go back to my IP, uh, ISE, and we look again in those property pages, oh, sorry, that's the wrong one, this is property pages. Um, again, we go back to this page with the outgoing IP addresses. Now, this time, we're actually not looking at the connector outbound IP addresses, we're actually looking at the runtime IP addresses. And the reason for that is that the runtime ones are the built-in connectors like HTTP. Uh, those, those are considered the core adapters, whereas the ones that have the ISC are the actual connector, and they're, and they're deployed to different subnets. But here's that list uh, of, I, of IP addresses, which we'll copy here, and paste in here, and we'll execute that so it looks a little bit nicer. And you can see that that IP address definitely uh, falls within this range here. We have 10, 1, 1, 0, but there's, but there's 32 addresses in there. So we've proven that um, that request actually came from within my ISC and it stayed within that network because it's used local IP addresses the whole time. Go. I will go back to, um, back to the slides. Okay, so the fourth scenario that I'm going to cover is, uh, is I don't really have a demo for this, but um, this is when you're working in a corporation where all the security has to be controlled through network level controls, like network security groups, for example, right? Um, so this is, this is pretty common. Um, the way that we secure logic apps, as I showed you before, is that shared access signature, right? When you have a, an endpoint. A uh, very common way of um, uh, w way, uh, signature, uh, sorry, met the security method for Azure resources. You also have the ability to restrict incoming IP addresses. You can specify a list that says, I only want requests coming from there. Uh, and if you wanted to use something like Act Azure Active Directory or OAuth or, or those other security models, you can do that, but you need to put API management in front of it, and then that gives you that capability. With an ISE, you can do all of that, but you also now have the opportunity to use network security groups, if you want, because you're working in a virtual network. Now, the only caution here is that you have to make sure that you don't close off the ports that the ISE needs in order to run. And there's actually quite a lot of them. So that link there takes you to a page that specifies all that detail. But one thing I can demonstrate for you uh, is if I show you um, in the ISC itself, uh, there's a page called Network Health. And it's probably going to take a, a minute to load. Uh, but the Network Health page is going to list for you all of your subnets in your ISC and all of the ports that, that need to be opened and which services are actually relying on those ports. And if any of them are closed, it actually will tell you that there's a problem. So um, I'll just give this about another 10 seconds. If it doesn't load, it won't, um, it won't show you. But there should be a, a pretty exhaustive list that comes up here. While we're waiting for that, does anybody have any questions at this point? That this works? No? Ah, there it is. OK, so if you see. Um, Basically, those are my four subnets, um, and everything is healthy. I get nice green check marks. Uh, if, I, if it wasn't, then it wouldn't be green check marks. But you can see it lists all of the different services and the ports that are relying on. So if you're going to start setting up network security groups in your virtual network, you've got to make sure that you have those open for your particular subnet so that you don't cripple uh, your ISC. OK. Let's do this. Okay, so I don't have an actual demo of it working, but here's, here's an example of a blueprint where you have a full solution, uh, which includes integration, and it's completely governed by a virtual network with, and segregated into various network security groups uh, that are in there. And what, you, what ISE has enabled you to do is put, be able to include logic apps in that solution. Previously, if you, you're relying on logic apps, they would have to live outside of that virtual network.
Okay, so those are the four scenarios I've covered. Um, I'll just talk through um, briefly, I think I'm doing okay for time. Uh, just a few caveats and tips uh, about working with ISE. Uh, it is currently available anywhere that Logic Apps is available, except uh, for these locations. However, I think that West Central US is now available because I'm pretty sure I saw it in the list when I was going to uh, provision it. And US Government Cloud, if it isn't there already, it's coming very, very soon. I've already talked about the VNet requirements and about the fact that you have to uh, provision the VNet in the same subscription in the region as your ISE, and you have to have those four empty subnets when you're provisioning. Uh, one thing I wanted to let you know, if any of you go to play with this, and you're like me, you set up a virtual network for the purpose of doing this, uh, when you go to create your ISC, you might find it doesn't appear in the drop-down to select uh, the virtual network, and you'll be puzzling uh, why, why is that the case, because I actually did create it in the right region and the right subscription. Uh, I found I had to close the browser down and open it up again before it appeared, so somehow it's like some sort of cache had to be refreshed. Typical IT crowd solution, you know, turn it off and turn it on again. Um, if you make any changes to your virtual network after you provision the ISE, you may need to restart your ISE in order to pick up those changes. And that's very easy to do. On the overview page, there's a nice little restart button. Um, and the good thing, this is the difference between the premium and the dev SKU. In the premium SKU, you won't have any downtime. It'll make sure that your logic apps and everything will continue to run during a restart, which is a good thing, because it can take a few hours, apparently. Uh, but with the dev SKU, you're not guaranteed to have that re resilience. I have to tell you, though, that I restarted mine when I was running a dev SKU, and I didn't have any issues with it, with it working. But I, might not, I just might not have tested during the particular window that it did go down. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, the consumption-based versus the fixed-priced model. So consumption-based model, of course, you're very familiar with that. It's the typical serverless uh, type, of, type of model where you pay for what you use, right? The more, more you use the resource, the more you pay. Um, if you're doing that with logic apps, you generally, you know, you pay per action execution. Uh, if you need to use an integration account, then that's an extra charge on top of that, which is at pretty much a fixed price, that, that part of it. And I mentioned before that enterprise connectors are charged at a higher rate than the other connectors. With the fixed price ISE, you get, you basically, it's a flat price uh, for the month, and that includes virtually unlimited actions. Unlimited in the sense that if you really start getting, expanding beyond that 160 million, then you're gonna probably wanna scale up uh, to make sure that you can accommodate it. Uh, the standard integration accounts included, and the enterprise connector includes unlimited connections. To understand this a little bit better, I've created a more visual representation. Uh, with standard consumption-based logic apps, um, as I said, the more you use it, the more actions, the more you pay. And it's pretty much a, a straight line. And if you're not using an integration account, then it starts at zero. If you are using an integration account, it starts harder than zero because you pay the $1,000 a month, whatever. Uh, but it's still a straight line. It's still your overall cost is based on how much you actually use it. With an ISE, it's a flat cost. So you pay a certain amount at the outset. And you keep paying that amount until you need to scale it up for whatever reason. And then it jumps again, uh, you know, about half, the uh, about half the cost of the base unit for each additional scale unit that you add. So that means that there is uh, a potential sweet spot, right? Where if you're executing a certain number of actions at, at, a, at a certain tipping point, it will be cheaper to use an ISE than to use the consumption-based model. But, you know, it's only within that range, right? Uh, where this starts to fall over is when you talk about geo-redundancy. Because in order to be geo-redundant, uh, that means you've got to provision two ISEs. So now your ISE cost is double uh, what it is before, right? Whereas with your consumption-based model, we're, we're assuming that you're using the same number of actions. You just want to have the failover capacity, the resiliency, right? So the only thing that would change in the consumption-based model is an integration account if you're using it. You'd want to provision another one of those probably in both, both regions. Um, and therefore, that price would go up. But as you can see, you really don't have much of a sweet spot anymore, right? So the reason why none of my scenarios uh, included costing is because I, I believe that 
in the majority of situations, if you're going to use an ISC, it's not going to be driven by uh, being more economical for you to use it based on the number of actions. The reason you would choose an ISC is because you need those features that an ISC gives you in terms of the, um, the isolation and the security and the VNet connectivity. Uh, briefly talking about what's coming. Uh, so they're continually adding more connectors that can work in the context of an ISC. We're, we're seeing those grow over time. They're also talking about uh, a connector manager, which will basically, um, because remember I said the management components live outside the ISC, that means you can't change fundamentally how that configuration works at, than, than the, the, over the way it works in normal logic apps. But, um, but they're looking at something to give you some extra controls uh, for how you manage configuration, uh, specifically within ISC. And I think the connection man manager will do that for you. Uh, uh, bring your own SSL cert is something that would be a nice feature to have. Um, the US government cloud, as I mentioned, that's coming uh, soon, if it's not there already. Uh, one of the things they, they promised a while ago was an ILB I ISE, an uh, internal load balancer ISE, which is similar to what it is for an ILB ACE, ASE. Um, and that would be able to, con to lock your endpoints down to only be accessed internally. Uh, well, if you remember, I showed you that access endpoint that now has internal and external, so guess what? They've already delivered that. Uh, so we already have that. Uh, the other one was an inline code, which is a feature in Logic Apps where you can choose uh, to be able to put insert, inject your own JavaScript. But if you notice, this connector has a core badge on it, so they've also added that recently, so they've covered that. And uh, the last thing was the uh, support for ISE deployments within Visual Studio 2019, which officially is, is not supported, but my friend Bill proved that it actually works. So you can, you can do that as well. So that's, that's covered. So they're constantly uh, improving and maturing this model. So with that, to summarize, the key takeaways um, is that basically ISC fills a gap that we had in the integration services by, by taking the one service that didn't natively work within virtual networks and now making it so that you can. So basically, this is premium logic apps, right? You can run it inside of a virtual network, just like the other premium SKUs uh, allow you for the other services. Uh, because it's isolated, it gives you predictable and consistent performance, so it can shield you from the potential of a noisy neighbor in that region. And um, it basically allows your entire integration solution from end to end to now be controlled within uh, a virtual network and to apply that level of security to your solution if you want to. And of course, it's not for every scenario, right? So you need to really kind of weigh up the costs of it and determine whether or not the features that it offers are, are necessary for you and your solution and whether it would, would address that. Uh, I've included a bunch of uh, links here for some references, which you, you'll be able to access when I upload the slides. And uh, with that, I'm opening up uh, for questions. Yes. Are they, sorry? Rate limit. Rate limit. Oh, so you're wondering about throttling, basically. Uh, they are, but whether they're more uh, rate limited than they would be in a, a normal region, I don't think so. I don't think so. But rate limiting is, is an issue that, you know, it's been raised a number of times, and um, I know that some of the MVPs have given feedback to the product team about that there's been some performance issues with that, and they've improved it for some of them, so. But uh, basically, I wouldn't think that it would be, be any different, because it is really the same runtime. It's just running in your own virtual network. Yes? Uh, do we have a microphone? Yeah. <laughs> No, not working. Thank you. So, uh, what can you say uh, about the um, necessary opening ports, inbound, outbound, uh, knowing that um, the equivalent app service environment list of opening ports is a bit ugly? I suppose it's the same thing with the ISE. Uh, it's a bit. Did you opening say opening ports for management? You know, opening, inbound, yes. outbound. 
controlling uh, required it. for for it to work. Yes, well, the challenge there is, as I mentioned, is you've got to make sure that if you're opening or clo especially closing ports, that you don't uh, cripple the ISE in terms of how it works, and, and that's difficult. One of the things that would be really handy is if somebody created a, an ARM template or whatever that, that made sure that all the ports that were necessary were open, and then you could, you could work from there. Um, because right now, at the moment that you start to introduce NSGs into your network, you potentially start crippling unless you've manually opened those ports. So. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Anyone, anyone else? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, if you have anything uh, you want to talk about, I'm, I'm certainly around today and tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, happy to, happy to have a chat.